Welcome to the seminar series Hewer and Pipeline Engineering. My name is Bert Bossela. I am Scientific Director of the IKT Institute for Underground Infrastructure. In this seminar session we will again deal with open construction or the open cut method. That means the laying of sewers and pipes in open trenches. Specifically we want to look at the stability and structural safety of pipes. Basically two things are important for stability and structural safety. Number one, the pipe must be able to absorb the internal loads. That means a pipe that is under internal pressure, for example, must be able to absorb this pressure without breaking apart. Number two, external loads occur when the pipe is underground. That are earth loads, traffic loads or the pressure of the groundwater. All these loads must not overstress the pipe, so we need a proof of stability and structural safety. The essential stress situation under internal pressure is shown on this slide. The stresses can be calculated using the so-called Barlow's formula or Boiler formula. This formula can easily be developed with the following model in mind. The pipe is first divided into two halves. On one of these halves, let's call it the lid, act two forces. One is the force from the internal pressure and the second is the force from the holding tensile stresses in the pipe wall. Internal pressure and tensile forces must be in balance and both forces can easily be determined. The uplifting force on the lid corresponds to the product of the internal pressure and the diameter, that is pressure P times diameter D. The holding forces in the pipe wall are the circumferential stresses sigma times the wall thickness T and twice of course as there are two walls. So it's 2 times sigma times t. On the right we see how these two terms were equated with each other. 2 times sigma times t is equal to p times d. This equation can then be transformed at will. If you want to determine the stress in the circumferential direction at any pressure and diameter wall thickness ratio, for example the stress sigma equals p times d divided by 2 times t. The circumferential stress is the decisive stress in the pipe at internal pressure. But there is also stress in longitudinal direction. The pipe is pulled apart by the internal pressure also in longitudinal direction. After all, the pipe must end somewhere or have an elbow or band on which the internal pressure presses and then creates longitudinal stresses. These longitudinal stresses can also be easily determined by simply looking at the equilibrium at the end. This model is illustrated below. So we imagine that the pressure P presses on an end cap at the end of the pipe. This cap is held by the circular ring of the pipe wall. The cap therefore pulls on the wall so as not to be pushed away. We can then equate the pressure force on the circular cap with a holding force of the circular ring shaped wall. The corresponding equation we see here on the slide. The holding force is stress sigma times the circular ring surface and this is the circumference p, uh, pi, pi times d times wall thickness t. This stress must be equal to the pressure on the circular cap and that equals to p times pi times d squared divided by 4. We can also change this formula to calculate the stress. So here the longitudinal stress sigma axial equals to P times D divided by 4 times T. When comparing both formula, so the formula for circumferential stress above and the formula for longitudinal stress below, it is quite interesting to note that the longitudinal stress is exactly half the circumferential stress. So for practical purposes we only have to be able to derive the upper formula for the circumferential stress and then remember that the other stress is only half of it. By the way that the circumferential stress is twice as great as the longitudinal stress can also be observed when you put a sausage in the microwave. Under heat the sausage bursts lengthwise. And we now know why the circumferential tension is twice as great as the longitudinal tension. So the sausage must crack like this. 
If it were the other way around, the sausage would break in two parts. Anyway, the internal pressure puts considerable stress on the pipe and the boiler formula helps to estimate the essential stresses. In addition, there may be other stresses in pressure liners too. In pressure lines too. For example, in curved sections, drifting forces may arise. We may need an abutment in the ground to prevent large soil pressure. In addition, pressure surges in the pipeline can occur, for example, when fittings are closed. All this must be taken into account, for example, in the hydraulic calculation and in the choice of fittings. But let's now, to, uh, let's now look at the trench and the loads acting on every buried pipe, with or without internal pressure. I would like to explain this in three steps. First of all, we want to look at which trench profiles are basically distinguished. Then we will deal with a typical structural design model. And finally, we will discuss what consequences all this has for practice. We can see this very clearly from the current standard requirements. So, let's start with the trench profiles. In the statics of sewers and pipes, a distinction is usually made between three trench profiles, whereby one of these profiles is not actually a trench at all, but rather an embankment. In the first case, we speak of a sloping wall trench. We dig the trench in such a way that we maintain an angle of slope beta. Larger angles of slope are only possible if we know the soil properties exactly, because then we can calculate the stability of the slope. The main parameters are the internal friction angle and the cohesion of the soil. A sloping wall trench, of course, has a great advantage. We do not need any further securing. However, it, is, it, it also has a major disadvantage. We need a lot of space. And that can be expensive and also a problem for the environment. The second option is an embankment, which is not really a trench at all. The pipe is laid on the ground and only later the soil is installed next to the pipe and above it. In purely static terms, we speak of an embankment when we have no trench wall within a stretch of four times the pipe diameter. Or, in other words, if a trench is wider than four times the pipe diameter, then it must be calculated like an embankment. And now finally, on the right hand side, we have the third case, a real vertical trench with a trench lining on both sides. This is usually the most demanding in terms of structural engineering. We have already learned that even in stable soils, such a trench must never be deeper than 1.25 meters without securing the trench walls. This means that both trench walls have to have lining, for example, by using wooden planks, trench sheeting or shoring panels. The symmetry of the trench can be used to support both sides by means of bracing struts. Otherwise, we would have to anchor the trench shoring in the ground. For the structural calculation of the pipe, we then have to take even a closer look at how the pipe is bedded. How high are the earth loads from the main backfill and what role does the pulling of the shoring play in load distribution? To clarify all this, we have to describe the situation from an engineering point of view. We need a structural design model. So what does the standard model of pipe soil design for open construction look like? Well, in this picture, which is typical for pipe statics, we see a pipe trench with a pipe laid on the bottom of the trench. And in this picture, we can recognize the first essential assumption of pipe statics. And this is, obviously, we assume that the pipeline, the trench and also the loads have constant properties of the entire length of the trench, so that we can model the thing in a 2D, in a two-dimensional model. All properties remain the same. That means, along its length, the same pipe is always embedded in the same kind of trench, in the same technical way. Only then can we illustrate the structural system in a cross-sectional perspective, like on this slide. This flat model is, of course, an ideal state for which there can always be deviations in reality. It is important that these deviations remain so small that they have no influence on the structural behavior. 
So, if for example a single cable crosses the trench at the selected point, this is certainly not decisive for the model. And of course, the pipe wall does not always look the same along the length of the pipeline. After all, there must be pipe joints or even lateral connections. But even that is not essential for statics. We can still consider it a pipeline with constant properties along its length. But we also know other examples. If the trench width is suddenly twice as wide, or a larger heavyweight dam crosses the pipeline at one point, then this is of course a significant change to the system and its loads. In this case, in this case different statics must be calculated and possibly even three-dimensional calculations are necessary. But let's stay with the cross-sectional flat model. How does this model look like in detail? First of all, we have to describe the pipe geometry. Usually this is the diameter and the wall thickness of the pipe. The pipe material is then usually described by two further parameters for the deformability, this is the modulus of elasticity E, and for the breaking strength it is the permissible tensile or compressive stress sigma. And the trench must also be described with regard to geometry and material properties. The trench has a certain width and depth, and this is, of course, the reason for the overcover age of the pipe. The soil, in turn, has certain material properties. These include the internal friction phi and the cohesion C, as well as the specific weight gamma. The next question is then, which stresses act above on the surface and how are these represented in the model? Well, at the surface we may find, for example, bulk materials or dynamic live loads, such as traffic, which are usually modeled as wheel loads. All these loads generally act on the underground space vertically and spread out there. It is now interesting to see how the loads in the trench affect the pipe. Here there are special model ideas. And these models have two aims. On the one hand, they should provide results that also can be confirmed by measurements. But on the other hand, the model should describe what happens as clearly as possible so that reality can be mapped onto the model almost intuitively. And that is the kind of model that I would like to explain now. The first part of the model is also called silo theory or silo effect. It is based on the idea that the backfill in the trench can activate frictional forces on the trench walls. This happens when it is slightly softer than the existing soil. In this case, the backfill will, under its own weight, undergo a slight displacement in relation to the trench wall. These displacements activate the frictional forces. And the frictional forces then have a reducing effect on the vertical load of the backfill. Normally, the load on the pipe would be set at a value of weight gamma, uh, um, of weight gamma times height h. However, now the load can be reduced by the friction on the trench walls. How high the reduction is depends on the chosen shoring. If the shoring is subsequently pulled and a shoring trace with loosening of soil is created, then the friction is not as high as in the case of horizontal shoring where the backfill has been compacted against the existing soil. In any case, we can quickly see in a standard statics, for example according to German standards, where the silo theory has been used. Usually there is a coefficient kappa with which the vertical loads are reduced when friction is applied to the trench walls. If this value equals 1, no silo effect was calculated. However, if the value is significantly less than 1, the load is reduced. However, reducing the load in the calculation also means that in practice friction between the pipe backfill and the trench must be guaranteed over the entire service life of the pipeline. And that is a high demand because in many cases there might be other construction sites in the same area later. And these can change the soil conditions significantly. However, if there is friction and a silo effect, the vertical load stress in the pipe crown level can be calculated to reduction factor kappa times gamma of the backfill times overcover h. And this brings us to the next step, the vertical load distribution. The loads at the level of the pipe crown are not only carried by the pipe, but also by the adjacent soil structure, by the side fill. 
How the loads are distributed between the side fill and the pipe then depends on both the stiffness of the pipe and the stiffness of the side fill. High stiffness means high load, low stiffness means low load. A flexible pipe, for example, made of plastics can thus almost escape the loads. But of course, this only works if the side fill is well compacted and therefore very stiff. In any case, however, the pipe is loaded vertically and these loads must then be absorbed by the ground in the area under the pipe. So the pipe therefore needs a support. For the quality of the support it is decisive that the pipe is bedded evenly over the largest possible support angle. This is similar to a breakfast egg. It can be easily crushed on a smooth table top but it lies well protected in the egg cup. However, creating an even support for the pipe is not so easy. The narrow area under the pipe has to be compacted very well in order to get an even support. If the bottom of the trench has been heavily compacted with heavy equipment and then the pipe is only loosely supported by some sand, this is very, very unfavorable. The effect is then almost as if the pipe had been laid on a concrete slab. Structural engineers call this a linear bearing and in which the pipe experiences extreme bending stresses in the invert. Well, we have now described all vertical stresses from the surface load along the trench walls, the vertical load distribution and finally the support. What remains are the horizontal loads on the pipe. However, these loads have a rather positive effect. They do support the pipes laterally. First of all, these are the normal horizontal earth loads which are activated by any normal cohesive and non-cohesive soil. Depending on the degree of compaction of the lateral backfill, this is usually somewhere in the range of the normal earth pressure. In flexible pipes, however, there are also other reaction forces. A flexible pipe that is pressed vertically will also deform laterally outwards. This deformation activates so-called bedding reaction forces in the soil. As a result, the entire pipe soil system contributes to the load transfer through its deformations. So we can see the side fill is very important and has three crucial tasks. It is a vertical support for the load distribution, it is responsible for the creation of horizontal earth loads and it serves as a kind of bedding spring for flexible pipes, creating bedding reaction pressure. So we now know the structural design model. In practice, we must pay particular attention to the following three points. So, number one, if kappa is smaller than one, then obviously silo theory and friction on the trench walls were, were taken into account. Here the question is, can we really guarantee this friction in the long run? Or, for example, are further construction measures to be expected, which we change the soil conditions? Number two, the side fill must be very well compacted so that it can absorb vertical loads as assumed in the structural design. And finally, number three, the support must be even over the calculated angle. Only then is our pipe well bedded like an egg in an egg cup. So far, the structural model for determining the pipe loads. Of course, the structural engineer still wants to calculate the stresses and deformations of the pipe. How does this work? in the classical analytical way. Well, the circumferential stresses in the pipe wall are calculated from the loads. Here the pipe is considered as a circular ring that is as a closed curved beam. The circular ring is a triple statically indeterminate system. Using bar statics we can then calculate the internal forces that is bending moments, transverse forces and normal forces. Once we have the internal forces, then for a given wall thickness we also know the stresses in the pipe. And if the material is not overstressed by this, we have a first static proof. A second important proof is that the pipe does not deform too much under non-uniform loads. This can also be calculated. And finally, we can also provide proof of stability for flexible pipes. This is to ensure that the pipe does not buckle under uniform external pressure. For practical application, of course, it is important that the static assumptions also correspond to the reality on the construction site. 
And all those involved should be aware of this. Even if we often talk about pipe statics, this is actually pipe soil statics because the entire pipe soil system bears the loads. This means that not only the pipe must have the desired quality, but also the soil, especially in the support area and in the side fill next to the pipe. Here we see some engineering solutions to reliably form the support area of the pipe. If the trench is wide enough, the pipe support can of course be well compacted. However, we also see here pipe constructions which already contain the support as part of the pipe itself. Furthermore, it is also possible to work with laying aids on which the round pipe can be placed directly during installation. And in the top right hand corner, we see the example of flowable backfill that flows around the pipe and beds the pipe evenly. We will look at this in more detail in another seminar. As we have seen, the structural design model and the associated practical construction techniques are intertwined. And this is also evident in the construction regulations and standards. Once you have understood the structural model, you will quickly understand why those requirements are included in the standards. So let's take a look at some typical examples. Let's for example take a look at the most important European standard for open cut sewer construction, EN 1610. It explicitly states, pipelines and manholes are engineering structures in which the combined performance of construction components, embedment, initial and main backfill and native soil constitute the basis for stability and safety in operation. I think we all now know exactly what, it what is meant by this. And in the section below, the individual components are also named in detail. In addition, the standard gives concrete examples of how the load assumptions are influenced by the side conditions. We see an overview here. And everyone may ask themselves, looking at the static model, why these things are mentioned here. Why does the trench width matter? Well, it increases the vertical load, but not the silo effect. Deeper trenches bring more earth load, but for live loads it can be the other way around. The shoring or trench support system interferes with contact, especially if it is removed later. And poor soil compaction leads to lower stiffness and less internal friction. Pipe bedding and trench bottom must always be considered together, otherwise how can the pipe support succeed? Some construction sites look completely different from the later load situation and a separate structural analysis may be required for this as well. And when we talk about material parameters, this applies not only to the pipe, but of course also to the soil types and ground and soil conditions. And uh, that leaves the key word groundwater. This is a special technical issue. This applies, for example, with regard to soil properties and loads from buoyancy. And only at the end do we look at the pipe and its properties. Finally, I would like to talk about a special case, shallow buried pipes. So far we have assumed that the vertical stresses from traffic loads are distributed in the ground to such an extent that they can be assumed as constant loads in the plane of the pipe. However, this is no longer possible with shallow buried pipes. We can see from this picture that the relationship between pipe diameter and installation depth is crucial. Only when the pipe is deeper than twice the pipe diameter does the vertical load also generate a horizontal supporting pressure. Local loads, such as those typical for uh, stone pavement surfaces, lead to stress concentrations in shallow buried pipes. Similar results occur with the damaged road surface. It is also particularly critical when several local loads are acting together, for example with vehicles closely passing each other. And finally, of course, pipe damage also leads to further problems if, as a result of this, the longitudinal load-bearing effect is reduced. And that brings me to the conclusion of this seminar session. So, there is not only one type of trench, 
and the vertical trench with shoring is particularly interesting from a structural point of view. The static model we are using today is sophisticated, but the basic rules are easy to understand also for practitioners. Therefore, don't be afraid to critically examine a structural analysis and ask yourself, do the assumptions match reality at all? Or is there something completely different on paper than what is actually built outside? The requirements from standards provide good orientation here. Thank you.